Hi, everyone. Before we get to today's podcast, I want to let you know a couple of things. First, we're going to be taking a couple of weeks off for the holidays, and then we'll be back with new episodes starting in mid-January. We'll begin with a two-part special connecting the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow to issues of health, wealth, and violence in the African-American community today. And we'll be exploring what steps can be taken at the local, state, and national level to make reparations for this legacy. Lastly, if you've appreciated this series and would like to help us continue this work in the coming year, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to our nonprofit organization by visiting reckoningradio.org slash donate. You can make a one-time contribution or a monthly donation of any size, and all of it will enable us to continue bringing you this podcast for another season. That's reckoningradio.org slash donate. Now here's this week's podcast. This is The Reckoning. I'm Dan Gediman. In our last episode, we heard the remarkable story of Henrietta Wood, an enslaved woman who became free but was then kidnapped and sold back into slavery by a man named Zebulon Ward, who she eventually sued in court successfully for reparations. In this episode of our podcast, we'll learn more about this man. In addition to being a kidnapper, a slave trader, and the enslaver of at least 27 people, Ward also made a fortune as a pioneer of the convict leasing system, which through a loophole in the 13th Amendment, continued slavery by another name, and made men like Zebulon Ward very rich. This is The Reckoning. One of the differences between slavery and the convict leasing system was that the keeper of prisons had little incentive to show any concern at all for the well-being of convicts. That's Caleb McDaniel, professor of history at Rice University. He's the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Sweet Taste of Liberty, a true story of slavery and restitution in America. In researching his book, McDaniel uncovered the story of Zebulon Ward, a prison warden who became a wealthy man by harnessing the labor of the convicts in his care. Ward's big idea was to perfect a system of convict leasing already in place in Kentucky to generate as much income for the warden as possible. I asked McDaniel to give us the backstory on how this came to pass. Well, the state penitentiary in Kentucky was founded in 1798, but in 1825 it was reorganized on the Auburn Plan, which was so named because it was first applied in Auburn, New York. And this plan was actually the brainchild of uh, people who thought of themselves as prison reformers. They wanted to give prisoners the uh, opportunity, as they saw it, to rehabilitate themselves through labor inside the prison walls instead of being confined in in solitude in a cell. And so uh, in 1825, Kentucky adopted a system where prisoners in the state penitentiary would spend their days uh, manufacturing products that would be sold outside the prison walls. And to do this, they brought in a keeper who would manage the prisoner's labor and would be appointed by the state legislature. But instead of being paid a salary, the keeper of the prison would keep as much as half of the proceeds of the products that were made in the prison and sold outside the walls. So very quickly, this plan uh, promised to make keepers uh, huge fortunes. So by the time that Zebulon Ward Uh, made it clear that he was pursuing that job, it was well known as one of the most lucrative in the state of Kentucky. Okay, so thank you for that background information, because it seems important. So how did Zebulon Ward become the Kentucky warden? So Ward was um, nominated in the state legislature and appointed the new keeper 
1854, although he didn't take over the job until 1855. And very quickly, it became clear that Ward intended to exploit the labor of the prisoners uh, to the utmost to enrich himself. And in fact, about a year after he started, he renegotiated the terms of the job with the state and began to pay the state a flat rent of $6,000 a year uh, in exchange for which he would keep all of the proceeds uh, from the prisoner's labor. So from the state's perspective, this appeared to be a good cost-saving measure. Um, but what it enabled was a system of unchecked brutality inside the prison walls. The problem with these convict lease arrangements from the beginning was that it put all the power in the hands of businessmen who had every incentive to push prisoners uh, to make them the most money possible. And so their unfree labor was um, marshaled to line the pockets of men like Zebulon Ward. So from the very beginning, there were rumors that Ward was treating his prisoners uh, with uh, brutality, that he was requiring them to uh, manufacture uh, more than was really humanly possible in a particular day. Uh, one of his prisoners was actually an abolitionist named Calvin Fairbank, who found himself in the state penitentiary because he had assisted enslaved people in Kentucky in escaping to freedom, including a, a famous black abolitionist named Lewis Hayden. And Fairbank later wrote a memoir about the time that he spent in the penitentiary under Ward's regime, and he compared Ward to an overseer on a plantation and said that the power that he was given over his prisoners was almost as unchecked as a slave master had over slaves. Zeb Ward became warden of the prison in 1854. He leased it at $6,000 a year and made $100,000 out of the lease in four years. To do this, he literally killed 250 out of 375 prisoners. Ward was one of the strongest men I ever knew. Physically handsome, socially magnetic, but utterly devoid of heart or conscience. He was a gambler, libertine, and murderer under cover of the law. When he took the keys of the prison, he said, Men, I'm a man of few words and prompt action. I came here to make money, and I'll do it if I kill you all. He was as good as his promise. All the floggings I received under Ward were for failure to perform the tasks set for me to do, generally weaving hemp. 208 yards a day being what I was expected to perform, an utter impossibility. I was whipped, bowed over a chair or some other object, often 70 lashes four times a day. Every ten blows, inflicting pain worse than death. Once, I received 107 blows at one time, particles of flesh being thrown upon the wall several feet away. The other prisoners fared the same as I did when they failed to accomplish the work laid out for them. I have seen new men fall at their work, weak from flogging, and when taken to the hospital, die before morning from pneumonia and the strap. Younger and stronger men than I cut their throats and poisoned and hung themselves to escape the burdens thrust upon them. It strikes me that the difference between uh, a, a, a slave owner and a prison warden in this situation is that, you know, theoretically, the slave owner would have a nominal concern for the health of their slave be, uh, because if they drove them to death, they would lose the equity that they had in that slave. Whereas the warden, uh, if they drove someone to death uh, from overwork, uh, malnourishment, whatever, um, th no big deal. Yeah, yeah. One of the differences between 
slavery and the convict leasing system was that the keeper of prisons had little incentive to show any concern at all for the well-being of convicts. Someone who owned a slave at least had a nominal interest in uh, maintaining that person alive in order to uh, keep the the capital that um, that inhered in that person. But um, in the case of a convict leasing system like wards, uh, deaths became depressingly common in these uh, penitentiaries. In fact, uh, annual deaths at the Kentucky State Penitentiary grew over the course of Ward's tenure there, peaking at 23 in 1858, which was almost a tenth of the whole population. And after Ward left the prison, uh, investigators who came to look at his records found that the rate of mortality was higher than it had ever been in the history of the state penitentiary. That really foretold the the future of convict leasing in the postbellum South as well. Um, in fact, um, it was said that people who leased convicts from southern states uh, were so unconcerned about the deaths of prisoners that they said, you know, if one dies, they could just go get another uh, from the state. So um, when he takes over the Kentucky prison um, in 1855, um, what commercial activity were the prisoners engaged in that he was benefiting from? What were they doing or what were they making? The main thing that prisoners were making under Ward's regime in the Kentucky State Penitentiary were hempen products. So uh, rope and bagging for cotton bales that would be sold down the river. And so Ward made a, a very lucrative career of producing bagging that was marked with his name, the Z Ward brand. And so most of the prisoners would have been weaving this hemp into uh, various hemp products. Most of the hemp was grown there in Kentucky, um, often by uh, enslaved people who would break the hemp and then it would be brought to Frankfurt and manufactured into hemp and goods. So, yeah, in Kentucky, it, 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 you can't get away from hemp. It's, right. uh, it's grown by slaves. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's manufactured by slaves. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then what is it used for? Slaves bagging up cotton in the deep south plantations, right? Right. So hemp in Kentucky really connected the state to the cotton kingdom of the deep south because the cotton planters around Natchez or New Orleans depended on bagging to produce the cotton bales that made them so much money when shipped uh, from the port of New Orleans to foreign ports. So Kentucky was really part of this uh, transatlantic system of the cotton economy. And one of the main inputs it provided uh, was cotton bagging of the kind that Zebulon Ward forced prisoners to manufacture at the state penitentiary. Can you give us some sort of idea of what kind of money he was making from, uh, you know, let's just start with, with Kentucky because, uh, you know, but, but in a general way, let's talk about the kind of money that he made from this particular, um, yeah, you know, gig yeah. that he found for himself. Well, one of the problems with the the prison system as it was arranged in Kentucky was that it was very difficult for legislators to know how much the keeper was making, especially once Ward had negotiated a contract where he paid a flat rent to the state uh, and then had virtually unchecked control over the prisoners in the penitentiary. And so as the state legislators began to get wise to the ways that this might have been costing the state revenue, they, in 1858, uh, while considering whether to renew Ward's contract, uh, started to think about whether the rent should be raised. But I think uh, the fact that Ward was willing to pay as much as $12,000 a year uh, as he proposed shows just how valuable uh, the job was to him. Um, ultimately, the state decided to uh, 
raise the rent, but to select a new keeper, um, Ward was simply too tainted by the rumors of brutality uh, in the penitentiary and by the high rate of deaths. But Ward landed softly. Uh, he retired to Versailles and a sprawling farm in Woodford County, uh, where he had the the wealth now to raise thoroughbred horses. And by some estimates, he had made from fifty to seventy five thousand dollars in just a few years as keeper in Frankfurt. C- can you talk about, to the to the best of your knowledge? How, whether and how Kentucky's experience with prison leasing influenced other states like Tennessee to try this model in the aftermath of, of uh, the Civil War and why it was uh, deemed a good idea. Kentucky was definitely uh, one of the first examples of convict leasing being put to effective use by a southern state. Uh, and Many other southern states looked to it as a model, although they didn't turn to a system quite like the one Kentucky had until after the Civil War. And those economic imperatives only became greater after the Civil War when uh, the destruction caused by the fighting left many uh, southern states deeply in debt and with uh, prison grounds that had had in many cases been uh, used by military forces during the war. And so um, in Tennessee, for example, the prison system was $50,000 in debt at least after four years of fighting, and the U.S. military had confined prisoners of war uh, in the grounds. So the state found itself in a situation where uh, the prison was war-torn and in debt, and convict leasing was seen as a way to offload the costs of uh, keeping the prison open onto a an enterprising private contractor like in this case Zebulon Ward during the antebellum era state prisons were primarily filled with white prisoners as opposed to black ones right uh that it was actually if i understand correctly pretty hard to convict a slave of a felony and have them be taken away from their um their master and in, and imprisoned uh, that instead they were, you know, given 39 lashes or whatever it was on the public square. Um, and that even if they were to be executed, the state would reimburse the owner for the, some sort of market value for the slave. So if you could talk a little bit about sort of why prisons in the antebellum era were primarily filled by white people and then how that changed, um, afterwards? Well, before the Civil War, most prisoners in Southern penitentiaries were white because the laws of the states gave slave owners uh, a an extreme authority over the lives of the people that they owned. And so it was very difficult to uh, convict enslaved people of crimes that would cause them to be taken away from their legal owners and put into the state penitentiary. But that shifted after emancipation when, uh, in freedom, southern states realized that they could use the prison systems and the criminal code as dragnets to capture freed people and confine them in prisons and continue to exploit their labor. Zebulon Ward was right at the center of that transition. After the Civil War, he moved to Tennessee and took over the state penitentiary there, which very quickly uh, began to fill with black prisoners who were sent to the state penitentiary by county, the same county level officials that were founding the Ku Klux Klan and waging uh, a war against emancipation in post-war Tennessee. And subsequently, Ward moved to Arkansas, where he took over the state penitentiary there. And it, too, very quickly became a tool for uh, racial domination by the white politicians who managed it. Two years after Ward took over leasing the Arkansas prison, a Little Rock newspaper ran an expose into Ward's mistreatment of the prisoners. As a result, the state launched an investigation into the allegations. And while it found evidence of, quote, unusual and unwarranted whipping, 
Ward received little more than a slap on the wrist. As Arkansas officials continued to turn a blind eye to the carnage, one man decided he just couldn't stay silent. To the Honorable Board of Commissioners of the Arkansas State Penitentiary, Gentlemen, I herewith submit to you my report as surgeon in charge of the Arkansas State Penitentiary. Dr. A. H. Scott considered himself a Christian man, and in his mind, the brutality he witnessed on a regular basis at the prison was decidedly unchristian. He tried to persuade Zebulon Ward to change the way prisoners were treated, but when it was clear that no such changes would be made, he wrote out a list of complaints and sent them to the prison's board of commissioners. It's a very long letter, which we've edited down to his most salient points. First, the prisoners of the Arkansas State Penitentiary are improperly nourished. They are fed incessantly upon poor beef, which generates the largest percentage of disease known in the institution. Second, the prisoners are overworked, usually more than 12 hours a day, and are often forced to walk for five miles after work, thereby inducing overheat, hemorrhages, heart disease, and other sickness. Third, a very large percent of prisoners bear marks of extreme violence upon their persons, some of them for months after its infliction. Fourth, the sick are not furnished with proper diet clean wards, or bedding. But the most outrageous practice is that of starving the sick to death. I have seen sick prisoners perish and die when I believed they would have survived if they had been furnished with nourishment. Fifth, the convicts are the stock and trade of the penitentiary's manager. His position is paramount to a slave master in the days before emancipation. It is human nature to be avaricious, but with such power over such resources, God help these poor wretches. We could find no record of any significant actions taken as a result of Dr. Scott's charges against Zebulon Ward. It seemed that no matter what Ward did or how many complaints were filed, no one was able to remove him from his job, and he remained as warden of the penitentiary until 1883. But even after that, he continued to lease convicts from the penitentiary to work on his cotton plantation and to take part in various building projects that he oversaw. So to to wrap things up here, um, how wealthy did he become from all this prison leasing activity that he did in these three states? Ward had had definitely learned from Kentucky and Tennessee uh, just how much a man could make by pushing prisoners through a convict leasing system. And so in the 1870s, he learned that the Arkansas State Penitentiary was being leased out to the highest bidder. So he moved to Little Rock and took over the third penitentiary that he had run. And it was the one that made him the wealthiest. By the time he died in the 1890s, he left behind an estate that was worth at least $600,000 to his family. And that would have made him a multimillionaire in today's terms. So it was a very lucrative business, but a brutal one that Zebulon Ward had gotten into. Caleb McDaniel is a professor of history at Rice University and author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Sweet Taste of Liberty. A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America. The Reckoning was written and produced by me, Dan Gediman. Our production team includes editor Loretta Williams, producer Nancy Rosenbaum, and assistant producer Rhonda Rogers Van Dyke. We had legal assistance from the Dinsmore and SKO law firms. Our theme music was composed by Jacory 1200 Arthur and voice actor Alec Voles, read the words of Calvin Fairbank and A.H. Scott. Major funding for this series was provided by the Community Foundation of Louisville, the Snowy Owl Foundation, and Eleanor Bingham Miller. Special thanks to the Filson Historical Society, Dr. George Wright, and especially to Val Jones.
If you like this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you found our series and leave a review telling what you liked. That'll help other listeners find this podcast in the future. And for an even deeper dive into this subject matter, please visit our website, reckoningradio.org, where you can find a detailed bibliography, free educational curricula, and over 100 oral histories of formerly enslaved Kentuckians. And while you're there, please click on the Donate button if you'd like to make a tax-deductible donation to keep this podcast going. That's reckoningradio.org. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.